Robert Kennedy Jr., son of the late Robert F. Kennedy, has spent his life fighting for causes he holds dear, including controversial ones. For over three decades, Kennedy Jr. served as an attorney for top environmental groups, going toe-to-toe -to -toe in lawsuits against corporate giants. More recently, he's questioned the safety of vaccines, eliciting rebukes from a consensus of mainstream scientists and even from family members. He's here to talk about the 2020 presidential race, the future of the planet, argue with me about vaccines, and speak to the legacy of his family in the age of Trump. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to Influencers. And welcome to our guest, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine advocate. Robert, welcome. Good to see you, Andy. So um, let me ask you first of all about the wildfires in Australia because it's a huge environmental crisis down there and you're an environmentalist. Um, how do you think that that is being handled down there. And what do you think that reflects in terms of how we're handling environmental crises around the world? Well, I think, it, you know, it's a predictable byproduct it's of, of climate change. And, you know, I live, as you know, I live on the West Coast now. And um, the houses that I, the house I lived on the West Coast has been evacuated. We've had to evacuate twice in two years. It was very unusual because it's, it wasn't an area that was part of the traditional fire zone. But the fire seasons in California now are two months longer than they historically have been. The same week that we were evacuated on the West Coast, our home, we have a summer home on Cape Cod, which, um, which was, and that town was struck by the second storm in two years that destroyed a pier that had prior to the first storm been there for a hundred years. So, you know, that all of the modeling for climate change indicates that we're going to be facing superstorms, storms on steroids, droughts, you know, uh, famine, the, the disappearance of the ice caps, the disappearance of the glaciers on every continent. And that it's going to be, you know, there's going to be major disruptions, not just to humanity, but ultimately to civilization. And this is part of the cost that we're paying for our longtime deadly addiction to coal and oil. Right. Um, if we had a true free market economy, those industries would be paying the cost of um, of global warming to all of us, you know, they wouldn't be able to externalize those costs. So how would you mitigate that then? Well, I mean, I, there's two questions. How do you fortify the planet for the up upcoming cataclysm for rising seas and disappearing water? And the other is, is there, what can we do to mitigate future impacts? And to me, you know, the answer to the first one is clear. We actually, you know, we impose market discipline on the energy markets. We take away the subsidies to coal and oil. According to IMF, those two industries get about $5.2 trillion in subsidies annually, and they couldn't compete on a market in the market. In fact, last year, 63% of the new generation that was constructed worldwide was renewables, and it wasn't constructed because government ordered it. It was constructed because the markets are dictating it. It's by far the cheapest form of energy. Solar today, um, you know, according to Bloomberg Energy, is about uh, 17 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas you know, nuke is uh, 10 times that. Right. Oh, and coal is five times that, and gas, or coal is about seven or eight times that. Um, gas is a triple that. So right. oh, if we really had, if people really believed in free market capitalism, um, you know, so yeah. every subsidy, right. every pollution is a subsidy. Right, right, and, right. You know, and if we really believed in free market capitalism, we could solve right. this problem overnight. What? 
Democratic candidate has the best environmental platform, which one do you support then? Well, uh, you know, I would say all of them have a better um, environmental platform than the current president. And I think um, all of them would do well on the environment. Um, and so I think most Democrats are just looking for a candidate who is able to beat Donald Trump, which is a very formidable task. Yeah, well, is there one that you favor in particular? Well, I don't, I haven't made any endorsement. Um, so I'm just kind of looking what's, I'm watching the debates, I'm watching what's happening to the primaries. My kids are working for Mayor Pete. Um, my cousin Joe is working for Elizabeth Warren. There are a number of other members of my family who are working for Joe Biden. We have relationships with, you know, very strong relationships with most of the candidates. And uh, I kind of go back and forth. I hear them debate. I love Tulsi Gabbard when she talks about our foreign policy, I think. Um, you know, I'm most closely aligned with her, with her vision for foreign policy than any of the other ones. Um, they're all pretty good on the environment. Right, so you have your take a little bit, you go back and forth, the Kennedy family and spread I, around right. at this point. And, yeah, I, and I, I haven't made right. an endorsement. What yet. about uh, AOC's New Green Deal? What do you think about that? I, I you know, the I Green think, New Deal, excuse I me. I think the Green New Deal is, you know, all of that stuff is important, it's good, we ought to be pursuing it. My approach is more market-based than kind of top-down dictates, um, you know, I believe that we should use market mechanisms like um, like carbon taxes and, you know, and the elimination of subsidies. And I think that, that those are the things that would transition our economy fastest from a, uh, from a coal-based economy that is kind of with the rule. We, right now, you know, we ought to have a market-based economy that does what a market is supposed to do, which is to reward good behavior, which is efficiency, and punish bad behavior, which is inefficiency and waste. Right now, we have a market that is governed by rules that were written by the carbon incumbents to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, most poisonous, most toxic, most warmongering fields from hell rather than the cheap, clean, green, wholesome, and, and patriotic fields from heaven. And, you know, we need to rationalize our marketplace so that it does the things that a market is supposed to do, which is to create a society that we're all proud of and that will sustain our children. You mentioned your family a little bit, and you also mentioned President Trump. Now, the president has many family members working with him in the White House. As a member of a famous American clan, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't think it's a good or a bad thing. I, you know, I, I don't think that's the problem with the president. What is the uh, problem with the president? Well, I think the problem is, number one, he's a bully. And, you know, I don't like bullies. And I don't think America, you know, that that's part of America's tradition. I think in many ways he's discredited the American experiment with self-governance. You know, I worked in China for many years and all over the world. Even 10 years ago, if you talk to the top leaders in China, what they would say is, you know, we are working toward, more toward the American model of democracy because we know that's kind of where we want to go. Mm -hmm. But we've got a lot of problems. We have billions of people. We have a lot of poverty and we need to do things slowly and incrementally and we can't do it precipitously, but that's where we're headed. If you go to China today and ask them, do you want a democracy like America has? Oh, um, and you ask anybody in the world this, they will say no, because why would we want a form of government that can produce leadership of you know, a person who doesn't read books, who's not thoughtful about issues, who's, um, you know, who's bullying, who uses all the, who employs all the, you know, the dark alchemies of demagoguery um, and is, you know, is, um, is destroying so much about the, about the things about America that we might admire and that make us an influence, that make us an exemplary nation. After President Kennedy, I mean, one of the, my kind of models is 
um, is influenced a lot by what I've seen around the world over the last 50 years. What I saw after my uncle, President Kennedy's death, he, if you go to any capital in the world, you'll see there's a boulevard named after John Kennedy. There are, are hospitals, there are schools, there are universities. The biggest statue in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia is one of my uncle. And you know, that love for America, that was, that, that is, that is, um, that is demonstrated by those things. And there's people named John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. I've, I've run into thousands and thousands of them across the world. Love for our country that, that represents was an asset for America. It was a financial asset. It was a security asset. You will not find anybody, any boulevard in any nation in the world named Donald Trump. Except one that maybe he... Well, yeah, you'll find you know, hotels with his name right, on hotels, them and stuff right, that yeah. he's put his name on, yeah. but you won't see situations where a government or people right. or a community has said, this is something we admire. And, you know, I think that's, um, you know, that's a measure of success for a president. That's one of the measures that we ought to be looking at because it's in sort of such an important and critical asset for America in terms particularly of our national security. If you have people who admire our country all over the world, we're much less likely to get into a war or conflicts. Right. And your cousin's wife, Amy Kennedy, is going to be running for Congress in the seat vacated by Jeff Andrew in New Jersey. What do you think about that? I applaud her. I think it's good that the in-laws now start getting involved in the, in the Kennedy family business. It's funny. And what about President Trump's uh, record on the environment? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a cataclysm. Um, you know, I don't think President Trump came out of, you know, is an anomaly. I think he's simply the radical acceleration of a process that's been happening in our country and in the Republican Party for the past, uh, really, since 1980, which is a growing hostility toward the environment, a, a growing orientation to representing the, you know, the, the um, a concentrated corporate power and you know power of particularly of the oil industry and the and the chemical industry and some of the other large polluting industries and as a result of that under George Bush and under um, President Trump George W Bush we saw really an open assault on all of our environmental laws what are you trying to do as president of Waterkeeper Alliance Oh, we have litigation against the administration. We probably have a dozen lawsuits now, and then you know we're doing what we do. We now represent we're now the biggest water protection group in the world. Um, we're in 44 countries. We have 350 patrol boats patrolling local waterways and um, rivers and and bays in 44 countries. And we patrol those waterways, we track down polluters, and then we stop them. We use, we use litigation a lot. Oh, we use all the tools, what, what Martin Luther King said, were the tools of advocacy, which is agitation, legislation, litigation, and education. And I would add innovation. And that came out of River Keepers, which was an organization that the you The first water keeper was this kind of blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen that mobilized on the Hudson in 1966 to reclaim the river from its polluters and they began suing polluters on the Hudson and they hired me as their attorney in 1984. Um, we brought hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits. Today the Hudson is an international model for ecosystem protection. It's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic north of the equator. The miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation now of you know, river keepers all over the world. And we're not only the largest water protection group, but we're the fastest growing. So we've talked about how environment is under siege here in the United States because of legislation or rollbacks maybe by the Trump administration now and the Bush administration prior to that. Where do things stand internationally, Robert? Are things getting better or worse outside of the US? Well, thing, I mean, 
the environment is under assault everywhere. Right. Um, you know, because of, principally because of fossil fuels, uh, which are not only um, causing climate change, but also acidifying the ocean and, and, you know, poisoning us all with mercury and uh, with acid rain, which destroys forests and, uh, and ozone and particulates, which cause uh, around 700,000 uh, deaths annually, globally around 20,000 in the United States globally. So all of those, you know, the, the environment is under assault. Um, you're, you know, the, the, the things that we can be hopeful for is one, there is much more knowledge about um, the problem and, and there's a lot of activism taking place now around the world. And then the, I think the big hope for the future is uh, technology, is that we do have the technologies today to solve most of our you know, most dire environmental problems with the exception of population. But, uh, you know, we have wind and solar has now plummeted. India just canceled $14 billion worth of coal plants. Mm. And that's more than, than the entire coal fleet of Great Britain because the cost of solar has dropped so precipitously. So uh, there's hope that we can plant, um, that we can power the globe, um, renewable energy. And the, the question is, you know, it's a race, really a race to bottom, the, you know, how many species are we gonna be left with? Right. Um, how dire is the situation, how many people are gonna be displaced by drought and famine? Um, before we actually cross that threshold and, and stop producing fossil fuels. Are there any companies that, to your mind, have figured it out, have got it in terms of helping the environment rather than hurting it? Well, yeah, there are many, many companies out there that have that commitment. You know, unfortunately, it, it's not just about kind of being an example. We actually need rules that, you know, that reward good behavior, that right. say to you, we're not going to encourage you to make money by hurting people or, and by, you know, by making, by degrading our country and getting us into wars or polluting the planet or whatever. We're actually going to say, you, you, we want you to make money. We want you to do well by doing good. And it's easy to design market rules that do that. The market is right. the most powerful economic engine that's ever been devised by humanity, but it has to be harnessed to a social purpose. Otherwise, it just it will lead us down the um, inevitable road of, of political oligarchy and, and corporate kleptocracy and environmental um, apocalypse. Let me switch and ask you about vaccines. Um, I'm curious, how did you um, come to the position that vaccines were a problem? First of all, you started out by introducing me as anti-vaccine, which I'm not. People say I'm anti-vaccine because they don't want to have the argument with me about how to improve vaccines. And um, I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm, uh, I'm, I believe we should have safe vaccines, and I believe we should have robust science, and I believe that we should have independent regulators who are not financially tied to the companies that make our vaccines. So the, the problem with, there's a couple of problems with vaccines. I had, when I, I had three vaccines as a kid, but today's kids get 72. And the reason they get so many is because they're so profitable. And they were made profitable in 1986 when Congress passed a law right. that said you can't sue a vaccine company. So no matter how toxic the ingredient, no matter how negligent the company, no matter how grievous your injury, you can't sue them, which means that company has no incentive to make them safer. And remember, the four companies that make all 72 of the vaccines that are now mandated for her kids are all serial felons. Well, how did you, wait, so how did you get, pick this issue though? That's my question of all well, the other issues I, out there. The reason I picked the issue, it, it kind of picked me, is that okay. I, First of all, I was suing a bunch of coal burning power plants and cement kilns in 2004 yeah. for discharging mercury, yeah. poisoning all the fish in America. And 
um, people started coming up to me at that time, mainly women with children who had intellectual disabilities who were vaccine injured. And they'd come up to me and say, if you're really concerned about mercury exposures to children, you need to look at vaccines. And I didn't want to do it. Um, you know, my family's been involved in the issues of intellectual disabilities for generations. Yeah. It's something I grew up with, I care deeply about, but I wanted to spend my time protecting water. One of these women came to me on Cape Cod in the, at the end of 2004. She had a big pile of scientific studies and she put them on my front stoop. And she was a psychologist from Minnesota. Her name was Dr. Sour Bridges. Her son had been um, a perfectly healthy boy, got an autism from a vaccine. The vaccine court had acknowledged that that was true and given him a $20 million settlement. And um, she put this pile on my front step and she said, I'm not leaving here until you read those. Mm. And I'm very accustomed to reading science. It's part of my job. Right. Uh, I've brought hundreds of lawsuits. They all involve scientific controversy. I started reading that science and I was immediately struck by the huge delta between what the actual science was saying and what the public health so, agencies right, so that were convinced claiming. You, but, but there is, Robert, a, a huge body of science that doesn't support your position. Show it to me. Okay. Well, show it to me. I, I can, but okay. I'm not going to do that right here. Show me one study. I'll show you if a lot you of studies. Show me right a now, study I don't, I, listen, I just want to know. Vaccinated children want, are healthier I, than well, unvaccinated right. children. Then I will put that study right. on my website okay. and I will quit my job. Okay, we will send it to you probably. Yeah. And I'm just, I have no dog in this hunt. I'm just telling you that there's a big body of science and several family you, members of yours you, called you out you on say, this. Well, so, uh, so what would you say to them? Not to me. Well, no, what would you say I, to them? I've already said to them what I'm going to say to them, which I've written and is not published on our website. Right. Uh, what I say is people say there's this huge body of science. Uh, what the science consists of is a handful, a tiny handful of epidemiological studies that were written by industry and by the CDC, which is part of the industry. And none of those studies do, all of them are fatally flawed, and I can go through each one with you. And none of those studies do what you would want a study that you wanted to exculpate vaccines to actually do, which is to compare a vaccinated population to an unvaccinated population and then look at health outcomes. Um, the Institute of Medicine, mm -hmm. which is the National Academy of Science, which is the ultimate arbiter of vaccine safety science has repeatedly said to CDC, you are claiming that you have studied this issue, particularly the issue between autism and vaccines. You have not. Okay. Oh, it's not Robert Kennedy. It's the Institute of Medicine, which is the highest authority, scientific authority in our government, right. has repeatedly said to CDC, you have not done the studies necessary to make these claims that you are making. In 2017, you met with President Trump and you said he was going to appoint you head of a commission about vaccines. That didn't happen. Why is that? Uh, my assumption is, and, I, and my assumption is based on empirical observation, because I can't look into President Trump said that the industry at that point got to him. And, you know, Pfizer immediately after that meeting with me, Pfizer made a million dollar contribution to President Trump's inauguration. He then took people who were vaccine lobbyists, appointed them to the highest positions at CDC and HHS, and we were cut off. You have supported an organization that put a lot of ads on Facebook supporting your position, and now Facebook has banned those ads. Do you think that Facebook is censoring you? Of course they are. Facebook, all of the big tech is censoring any information about vaccine. That's why you can come up here and say I'm anti-vaccine, because I cannot, I, I there's no form. Well, you're partly anti-vaccine. No, I'm not. I'm against vaccines. I'm, I'm for vaccines, but I'm for safe vaccines. What's a safe vaccine? Listen, a safe vaccine is a vaccine that has been tested against a placebo or against, an, or against a unvaccinated group. And that with that vaccine, where we can see from science, that vaccine is averting more harm than it's causing. And that's all we want. 
And if you show me that study, Andy, I will quit my job at the CHD. I will post that study on our website and I will leave. Right now, not one of the 72 vaccines that is now mandated for our children has ever been safety tested. But how, would that, how is that possible? Do you really believe, Robert, that of all the 72 vaccines that you say are out there, that they're all unsafe? Is that really, it doesn't I, seem logical. I don't think anybody can say that they're safe because okay. they've, never been they've never been safety tested. And, and the reason they're not safety tested, the reason they have an exemption, every other medicine, is tested against a placebo, usually for five years in double blind tests, which means you give the blue pill to 10,000 people, the blue, the, uh, an identical blue pill to 10,000 similarly situated people, and then you look at health outcomes. Every other medicine, every other medical device has to go right. through that test. The only one that is permanently exempt from that is vaccines. And the reason for that, right. it's an artifact of CDC's legacy is the Public Health Service, which was right. a quasi-military agency, which is why people at CDC have military ranks. The vaccine program was initially implemented as a national security defense against biological attacks on our country. So the people who were running it wanted to be able to get a vaccine to market very quickly to deploy it to 100 right. million Americans without regulatory impediments. So they, they said, we're not going to call it medicine, because right. then we'd have to test it. Right. We're going to call it biologics, and we're exempted from testing. And that's why no vaccine has ever been safety well, tested. You have to admit that your position is controversial, and you have this strong reputation as an environmentalist. And a lot of people criticize you about these positions. Do you, are you concerned about your reputation? Well, of course, I'd rather have everybody love me, but I, you know, listen, this is, I, I'm seeing something where you're, we're seeing millions of children badly injured. We have, listen, here's what HHS says. If you were born prior to 1989, which is the year the vaccine schedule exploded, you have a 12% chance of having a chronic disease. If you were born after 1989, you have a 54% chance. Nobody's explaining why do all our kids have diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis? Why did autism drop from one in 10,000 in Europe, my generation, to one in 34 in the vaccine generation? Why did food allergies suddenly appear in 1989? They're all coming from vaccines, and by the way, right. It's not just me saying it. All those 400 diseases that suddenly became epidemic after 1989, every one of them is listed as a side effect by the manufacturers. Well, some people vaccines. say the measles epidemic that we've seen over the past few years is because there are not people getting vaccines. So well, there's that. So, and answer me this. Right. Why is it that CDC says that 39% of the people who got sick at Disneyland had vaccine-strained measles? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, don't I don't have well, the, the body the CDC. Of, of work that, uh, that I, you What say it says have, so. is, what it shows right. is that the problem right. is not that people are not getting vaccinated, it's that the vaccine is not effective as people say it people, is. people may disagree with that. Why don't we switch to something they less controversial? They, they would have to explain that. Well, though. okay, less controversial. Let's go to politics, which is usually more controversial than any other subject, but here it's probably less controversial. Um, I want to ask you about... Uh, Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax, um, because you come from a wealthy family, but you're also liberal, from a liberal family. Do you support Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax? I, you know, I don't know the details of her wealth tax, but I definitely think that the gap between rich and poor in this country is much too large, that we've destroyed the middle class, and, this, and, that the, and that the very wealthy people ought to be paying more in taxes. And corporations, I mean, why is it that Amazon didn't pay a dollar in taxes? All right, people, everybody should pay their fair share. What about what Bernie Sanders says in terms of billionaires shouldn't exist? Well, I don't think we should ban billionaires. I think, you know, that's not the way to go about it. Uh, you know, we had a 50-year part of our history, which is called the Great Prosperity, when we developed the American middle class, which was the driver of the world economy. It was the driver of our economy. It created happiness and quality of life in our country. And during that, most of that period, there was a 91% tax on the upper 
echelon. Right. When my uncle became president, there was a 90% tax on the wealthy in this country. Is that too much? Yeah, that's probably too much. You need to incentivize people to work hard, smart people to make money. But at the same time, um, we need to make sure that we keep the middle class intact and that, and that you know, we don't want the kind of country, the kind of distribution and wealth that they have in Latin America and right. elsewhere. It causes it cause instability, it causes unhappiness, it causes a lot of uh, fallout, of societal fallout that is not good for anybody. I mentioned Bernie Sanders. I guess I have to ask you, do you and your wife, Cheryl Hines, like Larry David's impressions of Bernie Sanders? Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we like yeah, Larry. is very good. And I don't know if you know that, but it turned out they both did 23 and Me, and they found out that they were, um, you know, actually distantly related. Which two? Larry and Bernie. Is that right? Yeah. That's not surprising. That's <laughs> no. very funny. And, and finally, last question, Robert. You've had to overcome all kinds of tragedies and personal demons in your life. How have you learned to manage those and, and grow and, and, and become a leader in your field? Well, I mean, that's a big question. You know, I, listen, I try to live my life like everybody. I, you know, I, I went through a, you know, an evolution, a spiritual evolution that was spiritual, mental, emotional, and many other things. I mean, for me, um, I struggled with addiction um, from when I was about 15 years old to when I was 29. And I think in many ways, my, um, my struggle to overcome that taught me a lot of lessons about how to live my life in a way that was um, less directed towards um, making myself immediately happy and understanding that any kind of, um, anything that I do that is consequential, that is durable, is gonna come from trying to be of service to other people. And that any time that I become the focus of my efforts, that it just, uh, you know, which, you know, that's a, it, a lot of life is about learning how to handle power um, because, you know, we all get to reduce, we all hit a bottom somewhere where our lives are, you know, are empty and, and, um, and nothing good is happening. And you pray to God and you try to get some direction and then maybe go forward and your life starts to get bigger again and things flow into it. And then your inclination is to say, at least mine, you know, is thank you, God, I got it from here. And then I drive the car off the cliff again. And a lot of life is really, you, you can't live off the laurels of a spiritual awakening. You have to renew your, um, you know, your spiritual reservoirs every day. And what I've found is the most reliable way of doing that is to try to look for ways to be of service to other people. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me, Andy. And thanks for your courage in covering that issue because nobody else will do it. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.